Welcome, Stefan, and uh, many thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Tomas. The stage is yours. All right. So I'm I'm flying without uh, without any notes or any uh, I have notes. I'm flying without any um, slides today. Um, apologize for my voice. I'm I've had a pretty bad cold for a couple of days. Um, I'm going to start out. I, I my understanding is this is a relatively intro uh, intro to Julia audience. So people are perhaps interested in Julia, have heard about it, maybe don't know that much about it. Um, so I'm going to try to give you a sense of what what the goals are, what the feel is, what what makes it you know different than other languages. Um, so the high level goal of the language when we created it was to be able to write sort of this, you know, familiar, easy, dynamic code that you, you would be familiar with if you, you know, have programmed in Python or MATLAB, um, <clears throat> you know, other languages that influence us, influenced us are Ruby, Pascal. Um, you wanna be able to write code that doesn't necessarily get into the nitty gritty of types and have to satisfy a, a type checker, um, but you also, want to be able to get good performance. Um, sorry, someone pinged me, but apparently it's not Tomas. <clears throat> All right, so here's a really simple example that I like to start with often. Um, so just exploring the Julia set in Julia, it's not really what the language was named after, but you know, it's a really, it's a good coincidence. It's a nice example. Um, so many people who have done any sort of numerical computing have seen this, you know, doing fractals was in, one of my first introductions to programming back in the day. Um, so the way you compute the Julia set is you have um, these two input numbers and they're actually, they're complex numbers and we'll, we'll put a complex annotation there. We don't have to, um, but you can. And what the annotation does is it says, if you try to call this function without these things being complex numbers, you actually won't get an answer. Uh, we'll we'll tell you it's a method, no method error. But let's let's leave them off for now. Um, but we can put them there. Um, so you evaluate this. It doesn't do much. It just defines the function and just says you've got a generic function with one method. So what can we do with this? Well, we can. There's here's a notation for a complex number. Here's another complex number, and we can call the function with that number. We can, you know, move the numbers around and see what happens at different numbers. We get different outputs. And, you know, if you're familiar with the Julia set, the way it works is you do this, uh, this iteration, uh, you apply this, this up update function to Z multiple times and then see if it escapes a certain radius, then you say that it's going to escape at that point. And that N, that the amount of time it takes to escape is the, the value that you plot. You sort of care about how long the escape uh, time is for various points. Um, and, you know, we can, the, the arguments don't have to be uh, complex numbers because we didn't specify that. That can be anything. So this is like the classic, uh, you know, Python duck typing. Any type of thing you put in there, if it quacks like a duck, if it knows how to do, you know, the squared absolute value and it knows how to, you know, you know how to square it, then you're good. You're good to go. You need to be able to square things and add, add the values. And, you know, for an integer and a, and a, and a floating point number that works just fine. Now, of course, the classic thing people want to do with this is they want to plot big arrays of them and see what the values are. Um, you know, this is the worst plot of a fractal ever. Uh, but it's, uh, you can see that what the numbers are in the upper left, it's, you know, very rapid escape, not very interesting in the top right and lower left, um, you got some more interesting numbers, but you know, what, and we'll, we'll plot those in color in a second, but let's first, let's see what Julia is doing under the hood. Um, and one of the things we implemented very early on that is still a real power tool of the language is the ability to inspect native code, different levels of compilation, basically. So we're going to look at the native code, which is the like final output. Uh, but you can also look at the the, the lowered code, what Julia sort of internally represents the code as, you can look at the typed code. So that's after it's been lowered. And then you do some analysis of the code to figure out what the types of things are. And you can also look at um, LLVM is what we use as a compiler backend. Um, and you can look at what, what the LLVM code for anything is. 
Um, so here we're going to look at the native code, and you can see that this is pretty pretty small, tight native code. Um, I'm on a I'm on a, a Mac, one of the recent Macs. So this is a uh, <clears throat> this is the um, it's not PowerPC. That's the ancient one. Um, ARM. It's one of the. It's these are ARM instructions, not x86. Um, we can look. Let's see what the LLVM code looks like. If you've ever seen LLVM, it looks like this. It's not very readable. Um, it's actually less readable even than the native code. Uh, we can look at the the lowered code, and you'll see that's actually a little more readable. It's basically the same as what the Julia definition is, but with some things turned into a simpler form. Um, and you know, sometimes that's of interest, but usually it's not something you you need. But the typed information is interesting. It's lowered even more, but you can see that Julia has gone through and figured out just based on the code up here, and then taking the inputs, and we know the inputs because we've been given them here. Um, you know, so we know that these are complex floats and we can go through and infer what the type of every single statement in, in the code is. Um, and, you know, this will actually also highlight in red uh, if there's something that's like kind of a sketchy type that might be hard to see, or I think that might be type worn. There's a different, different thing that it will do that for you. Um, but this is essentially how Julia gets high performance, right? It's the combination of you write this fairly simple code. We have actual runtime types that you have given us that you want to compute with. And then at that time, the system does type inference and figures out what the types of everything are and then generates code for that specific thing. Um, so this gives you the feel of a dynamic language with the performance of a statically compiled language. Now, the, of course, the flip side is that you have to wait for that compilation to happen. For something as small and trivial as this Julia uh, function computation, it's, it's quick, right? None of the, this takes so little time that a human isn't going to notice. But if you're installing huge, complicated packages and lots of them, which is easy to do because our package manager is very good, and I'll talk about that next. Um, but it it becomes it can become painful to wait for. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing is shifting shifting that time closer and closer to when you install things rather than when you need to use them. Because what we've found is that people get pretty annoyed when they want to go use something um, if they then have to wait a long time, especially because that's repeated. You use a thing a lot of times, you install it a couple of times, you know, maybe you install it once and then you install an upgrade and then you install another upgrade. Um, so we've been pushing uh, the, we've been pushing the, uh, the, the compilation time earlier and earlier over the course of Julia. Um, <clears throat> you can also see that, you know, you can use uh, complex integers here that will give you different code. It's not the same. This is all floating point operations and this is all integer operations and it's a little simpler. Um, but you know, it, it, the same code gives you, gives you many different possible outputs. So you can think of a Julia function when you type it as it's really, it's really a template for lots of different instantiations of that function rather than, uh, it's not like C code where you write one function and there's only one version of that. It's more like C++ with templates, but without all the pain and suffering. Um, so of course we want to visualize a, a Julia set. Um, and here we can create a, <clears throat> this is a, a named uh, color map called red blue. Um, and we generate a, a palette of a hundred colors because our, our uh, max iter was a hundred. You can see the type of this thing. It's got an interesting type. And this is one of the, we didn't know this from the outset, but it kind of became part of the nature of Julia over time. And it's one of those emergent properties. Defining small, your own efficient types and then working with them is kind of a superpower of the language. Um, and these are types that are actually defined by colors. Uh, and colors uses, a, uses the fixed point uh, package in turn as a dependency. So this NF8 type is a, it's an eight bit, eight bit floating, you know, floating point number that is unsigned. 
um and the naming doesn't really matter it it exports a lot of types so it sort of has this naming convention for them but the key point is you get to work with a thing as though it were floating point but the actual representation is what images want which is 8 bit integers and so you've now you've now sort of bridged the gap between this like very efficient representation and the behavior you want. And the other thing that's nice about these types is because for these image channels, you want floating point values between zero and one. So that's how these are defined. They only can represent the, the values between zero and one. And they're specifically, they're useful for other things. You can use them for lots of things, but this is, they're specifically designed to be exactly what, what uh, images need for their representation. Um, and so that that really simplifies a lot of the higher level image code because now, you can write image code and you don't have to worry about like, oh, what, you know, what's the, what, what is the representation of this thing? Uh, what is the max value that it takes? And can we divide by that? And like that kind of stuff. You also don't have to worry about what dimension is the color and what dimension are the spatial dimensions, because what you do is you wrap this, this pixel, this, this in a pixel type, which is RGB, which actually says, oh, this is three of them. Um, and then, so essentially what you, your, your image, and you can see this now here, um, uh, the C map, if you look at the type of C map, so it's a vector of RGBs of this element type. So now the in-memory representation is just a big vector of, of UN eights, but, you know, conceptually it's a vector of RGB elements and they all go from zero to one. So we can poke into that a little bit. So we can pull out a single pixel. And you see the, this is, I'm in the Jupyter Notebook interface. So uh, a lot of people use Pluto now. Pluto is a nice notebook interface. Um, the reason I actually don't use Pluto for presentations is because Pluto is reactive and one of the, which is very cool. You can like change something and the whole computation rechanges and you can never be in a, in an invalid state because of that, which is really nice. Um, but I find it bad for presentations because there's no element of surprise. Right, you've computed everything, and then as soon as you change something, the whole the whole presentation uh, comes through. So Jupiter lets me have my surprise um, and evaluate things as I go. So I'm, I'm st I still use Jupiter for presentations. Um, so we can see the structure of this pixel object, and it's you know this is the type on top. Um, it's got an R field, a G field, and a B field. And those are of this, you know, this fixed point type. And the internal representation of that is just a UN8 with a particular hex value. Um, and we can pull one of those out um, and you see it's printed as 0 0.46 uh, with this suffix, which actually you can, you can input that. One of the reasons for these funny type names is because you can uh, you can actually input that back in as a literal syntax. And Julia allows juxtaposition of a numeric coefficient with a with a type with, with a with a, a variable name and so this multiplication is defined correctly so you get a, a the right value of the right type um but anyway you see internally this thing is actually just you know 0.7 is you know the the hex value 76 all right so enough enough about that details of of the internals of the type let's see some pictures okay well you know here's a nice spot in the julia set uh we can tweak it around and get some slightly different pictures. Um, this is, you know, one of the fun things about the Julia set is that it's, you know, very ad closely adjacent points look quite different. Um, anyway, enough playing with that. Um, <clears throat> famously, if you take the, so this is picking a fixed C value and then plotting over Z. Uh, Famously, if you take the diagonal where you fix C and Z to be the same value, you get the Mandelbrot set. That's the definition of the Mandelbrot set. Um, and of course, you know, we, we don't really want to be going in and typing these numbers and messing with them by hand so we can do much better. Uh, lots of There's lots of these interactive widget things in different notebook types, but, you know, Mathematica was a pioneer in this, and then Jupiter, of course, has it. I, th I think that the Julia, the Julia implementation of the Jupiter notebooks had this interactive stuff based on, you know, inspired by Mathematica before it propagated back into the Python ecosystem. That's, that's my re recollection of it. I could be wrong. 
So here we can, you know, move a slider around and it recomputes this whole thing for us. Um, and we can, you know, explore the Julia set nicely. Um, so I think one of, one of the things just to stop for a second that this shows is we, we spanned a really huge breadth of stuff here, right? We went from like, we're looking at machine code to we're interactively exploring Julia sets with like widgets in the notebook. And I think that's one of the sort of superpowers of the language is that you can span that whole gamut, right? If you don't care about the machine code, just don't look at it. You don't have to. Um, when you do, it's very convenient to have it right there. And I think by giving people that power, we've suckered a lot of people into becoming, you know, high performance programming people who would not otherwise, because they don't, you know, getting this information out of a C compiler is kind of a pain. It's doable, but it's it's a bit of a pain. Um, so, you know, because we've been suckered into being performance hackers, uh, this thing is a little, this works pretty well, but it's a little laggy. Um, let's see if we can make it faster. So if we think about what this is doing, it's every time it reevaluates this expression, when I drag the slider, it is regenerating a whole new array and displaying it. So that's a little inefficient. What if instead, we just tweak the code so that we, you know, allocate this image once before the manipulate expression. Uh, and then inside we just reassign the image and then return the image. So it's the same image. We're not gonna reallocate memory every time. Okay, well, you know, it looks the same. That's not not so exciting, but uh, it's a little, it's a little more responsive. It's slicker, it's a little bit better. Um and then of course, you know, one of the classic things you would do to make something like this faster is, you know, I've got lots of, I've got not lots, but I've got eight threads on this machine. Can we, can we use that? And of course we can, um, there's a threads macro here. Uh, what that does is it's a, there's, there's a, you can get into sort of much more detail with threading in Julia. Um, what the threads macro does is it takes a for loop and splits it up into the correct number of static iterations, assuming approximately the same work and farms out that work to different threads, different hardware threads. Um, so we can see that in action. And it's uh, it's even slightly, slightly faster. Okay, so that's good. Um, you know, you could go to town on this and try to make it SIMD. I think that's challenging because it's a variable number of iterations, but you know, there's, no end to performance hacking one can do on these sorts of things. Um, okay. Um, pardon, pardon my cough. I know it's uh, it's as bad as it sounds. Um, <clears throat> so one thing I'd like to show here, uh, let's see, is. Okay, so let's see if let me let me know if that's uh um I think that should be big enough for people to see. So this is the directory that I'm showing these notebooks from. So you can see that I've got my I I'm not going to go into the variations on some notebook because I think it's sort of similar to the some of the like low level stuff we got into with with Julia the Julia sets, but. Um, the interesting thing that I want to show you here is actually the projects, uh, project and manifest file notebook uh, things here. So the the extension there is dot tomal. Tomal is um, it's similar to like JSON or YAML, um, but it's a little more human readable and sane than either of those formats. Uh, Rust uses this. There's some Python things that use it. We picked it because it's you know it's pretty easy to read. Um, so if you look at this, this is a project, a Julia project. It doesn't, this is a kind of like a project that doesn't have much information. The only thing it has in here is what its top level dependencies are. And so these are all the packages I added to make that notebook and the other some notebook work. Um, and you see they're just names associated with a UUID. Uh, and the basic idea here is that you want you don't want to have name collisions have a, be a problem. If someone internally in your your organization uh, ha decides to have something called colors, they can as long as it has a different UUID, everything will work out fine. Um, which 
you know, is a, is a big problem in a lot of, a lot of ecosystems. This is a thing that I, that I, you know, encountered in, in the wild and had problems with and decided to solve when we decided to implement a package manager. Um, so this part is a little bit less interesting. The manifest is ma machine generated. As it says at the top, it's machine generated. Editing directly is not advised. Um, but what this does is it records, it's like a requirements.txt file in Python, except much, much better, right? This is, this is so unlike other systems like Python, this is not a thing you need to try to record. This is just how the package manager tells Julia what versions of things to run. So you can't even, this is just the default. This is recorded down to the bit. You know, we have cryptographic hashes of every version of every single thing that you're using uh, recorded in here and what the dependency tree is. And it, it's quite long. It goes on for quite a while, um, you know, but it records everything. It's machine generated. You generally don't want to edit it by hand, but it records perfectly everything that you've that you've done. So let's let's start. We're going to start a Julia session in the terminal in here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add. Let's say I want to use the JSON package. I'm going to add JSON. This is, so this is uh, there's a rep the, the Julia REPL has a special mode. If you if you type uh, close bracket. It enters the package mode and lets you do package operations. So I added this JSON package and it just added that at version 0 0.21.4. Uh, and we can quit here and we can, I've, I've, this is a Git repo, so I can see what the Git difference is. Um, okay, we don't, we don't actually wanna see the difference in the notebook. So let's look at what the status is. Okay, so let's look at the difference in the, all the TOML files. So you can see the only difference is now the we added the JSON file to the projects. So that says as a top level dependency, I now have JSON. It's available to my to my programs. I can load it. Um, what didn't change is the manifest actually didn't change. And what that tells us, it, the only thing that changed in the manifest is the hash of the project file. And what that told us is that JSON was actually already a dependency in here. We already had it in our project tree. Um, but what we can do is try to add something that we know isn't in there. Uh, I always love using the Acme package as an example, just because of, you know, whoops, wrong, wrong REPL mode. Um, okay, so we've added the Acme package. No, only want to look at the TOML files. And now you can see that it's actually added a stanza for the Acme package in the, in the manifest file. So it's recorded um, the name, its dependencies. So it know, we know what the tree is. It's UUID, so we know the identity. It's this Acme package. So if someone else happens to have something named that, you know, Bugs Bunny decides to register his favorite package, we know it's a different thing. Uh, we get the Git tree hash of the exact version that's installed, and we have the version number. Um, and then we see that it's added in the in the project file at the top level. Um, okay, so the main point of this is really just that Julia has a built-in package manager. It works extremely well. It's very common that you can just like do something on one platform and it actually will work on another platform, which is wild. Um, that's because we do crazy stuff with compilation, cross compilation for binary dependencies. Um, and by default, it provides reproducibility. It records, you know, exactly what version of everything you used and can reproduce it. Um, another thing that most people don't ever need to get into is that we have a package server system that serves up these packages to people and it caches them. So it saves them. We save them all in S3 buckets, um, and so we can serve anything you you instantiated at some point, we remember and we can serve up to you in the future. So even if the Git repo goes away, we remember the versions that were registered and installed for people. Um, so it's real, it's real, you know, it's a real commitment to to reproducibility long term, even even if you're just doing your day to day work. It doesn't mean you know, you still may want to do other things like Docker containers or whatever for, for, you know, reproducibility, but this really gives you a baseline level of pretty good reproducibility. <laughs> hmm.
Okay. Um, all right. So one thing I want to talk about uh, here is a little bit about um, multiple dispatch and sort of get into a little bit of the higher level, how the language works. So this is a function that I, <laughs> I posted in a thread recently where we were talking about and this may resonate with people on this on this in this particular workshop. Um, someone noted that the the rand function for float thirty two um, only uses about twenty four bits of uh, of entropy, and the problem with that is that zero happens, you know, one you know one in every two to the twenty fourth draws. And that's really not low. That's not a small number, right? You can you could get you get a zero fairly frequently. I think you know it's like a couple of seconds before you get a zero from float float thirty two rand, um, and that is you know so that that fails statistical tests. It uh, you know sixty four bit is fine. So anyone using sixty four bit is okay, but you know thirty for thirty two bit that's this is not great. For sixteen bit, it's really terrible. We, it's even it's even less than that. But of course, 16 bit is bound to have some problems because there just aren't that many representable values. Um, but float 32, we should be able to do better. We, you know, for example, it, it has the dynamic range to represent way more values. Just it's the way we're sampling is basically you do a, you know, you you do a fixed point number essentially between one and two, and then you subtract one to get down into the interval zero two. Um, there's a lot of bits that could be used in the lower end of that interval um, that we're not using. So a bunch of people are trying various tricks to, to do better. Um, this was one of my uh, examples. This is my code to, to do better. And what this does is it actually takes, so it takes the type as the first argument. So this is where we're getting into a little of the like more this, you look at this code and you're like, oh, this is definitely Julia code. Whereas my like Julia function, you're like, ah, it could be any dynamic language. It's very generic. So, you know, the first argument is a type uh, and we have this where parameter. So, so Julia has parametric types and parametric functions. Um, and so what this where clause says is that, you know, we're going to have a type parameter over this function. T can be any, anything in this union. So it can be float 16, float 32, or float 64. And what this says, we could put the T over here, but I want to specialize on it. So I put, put it as a type parameter of this special type called type. The only instance of this type for the parameter T is T. Um, but doing it this way lets me specialize on the type. So I'm going to generate code for every single type that gets passed in here. Um, the second argument U is just an is unsigned 64-bit float in, integer. Um, and if I don't pass that by default, just like generate me one for at random. Because what I'm doing is I'm defining my own rand function, basically rand f I called it. Um, so the first the setup of this function is actually computing a bunch of stuff that only depends on t. So this is all going to be constant in the code gen, and I'll show you that in a second. So you know the size of t times eight that's the number of bits. So this is going to be sixteen thirty two or sixty four depending on what T is. Um, P is the precision, and this is an internal base function that I happen to reach in, and it tells you like how many bits does this floating point type have. Um, now, U, the U type is just like, you know, the corresponding unsigned integer type, because I'm going to do some casting back and forth. And then this M is a multiplier that I compute um, for my algorithm. It... Um, <clears throat> This you know looks like it's doing compute at runtime, but this because this only depends on the type, it'll just get compiled down to a constant. And then the actual compute is here. Uh, I won't get into the nitty gritty, but basically we look at the leading zeros to figure out the exponent, and then we do some bit twiddling to to set the the rest of the bits. Okay, so we define this guy, and let's look at the code native for you know randf let's say float 16 um 
and a uint zero. Okay, well, there's a bunch of extra comment stuff in there that I've been, I've asked to remove for a long time, but I always have to set this debug info. All right, so there, this is the actual implementation of this code. So even though it looks like a lot of code, it's actually a handful of flow, of instructions, which is pretty pretty nice. It's very efficient. So you can see all that all that prelude stuff just compiles away, and we just have, you know, really really simple um, machine code. Um, if we want to see what happens with when if we include the random number generation so remember the default for the random number generation was um was that we you know we so the second argument gets provided at random so now this is the version where this is the entire code to pull pull the random number number generator it's saved in the stack uh in the stack object in the task object that we're in so it's on stack um, we can pull the pull the memory out of the out of the random number generator in the task. Uh, do the this bit up here, sort of the you know the middle. Sorry, this bit roughly is sort of the uh, this is this is the actual random number generation, and then down here this is the uh, the part where we actually turn it into a floating point number. So this thing is like about 4% slower than our current random number generator, which is which is simpler. And I, I was pretty happy with that. Um, okay, so this is, you know, I said I was gonna talk about multiple inheritance. I haven't really, okay, so, or not multiple inheritance, uh, multiple dispatch. Um, okay, so what's going on here? We're, we're dispatching on the ar ar first argument type, and then we're not dispatching so much on the second argument type. So wh what's multiple about this? Well, the, the interesting thing about this is this randf now, I can write generic code with this, right? So let's say I have some code that, you know, just needs to take a random number, let's say, you know, I'm just gonna call it add, add one, add, you know, randf to, okay, so this is, you know, incredibly dumb, but okay, so Okay, so I took 1.5, I took 0.5 and I added randf to it. Okay, why is this interesting? Well, in this current form, it's not super interesting, but one, one thing we can see is, you know, if we do float 16, 0 0.5, it still works. Um, if we do float 32, it still works. And it gives us the type of the answer is corresponds to the type of the input we gave it. Okay, so well, how far can we go with this, right? So let's try a big float. Okay, well, we can't do that. So now we have the problem randf type of big float doesn't, there's no method. But, you know, I could very well do that. Like, why, why can't we do that? You know, let's say I encounter this code in the wild and someone has defined this randf function. Um, and I'm like, well, I want to use it, and I want to use I want to use their definition for the types that they defined, but I'd like to add a new method to it so that my code will actually work. Um, and it could be a type that I defined. So if in the case of big float, it's kind of a little sketchy because it's like someone else's type and someone else's function. But if it's my type, then it's safe, right? It doesn't matter because no one else has this type. I've defined it. So let's, you know, Let's say that for, let's just say randf for, uh, you know, big float, you, we're just gonna call rand big float because we're lazy. Um, and in fact, we're, it doesn't even make sense to have the second argument that was really just for the implementation, so. So now we can go back to our, our definition. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the argument type isn't, isn't this, this says the argument is, uh, the our first argument is a big float. 
um, and I don't care about its value, which obviously is not really what we want. What we want is the first argument should actually be the type big float. Okay, so now it works, and we get a random we get a random big float added to zero point five, and you can see it goes over one. All right, so what this feels like much ado about nothing, um, and I'm a little over time, but really the the point of this is that the real power of multiple dispatch it's it's convenient to be able to dispatch on different argument types and sort of gives different specializations, but the real superpower of multiple dispatch is external dispatch. It's the fact that a different person can contribute an external uh, method to an existing generic function for a new type. Um, and there's this thing called the expression problem, which is a classic problem in PL design and multiple dispatch solves it really nicely. And the, the fundamental problem that people are trying to solve there is some languages are good at adding new operations to existing types, and some languages are good at adding new types to existing operations. So the latter is something object-oriented languages are pretty good at. The former is a thing that functional languages are pretty good at. But neither of them is good at the other, and we need to do both of those things all the time. And this is just a simple example of adding a new type to an existing operation. But, you know, I'm in the same boat if I then like am in the, in defining Randf. So multiple dispatch made all of this very easy. There was nothing particularly hard to do. Um, I gave a talk about this in 2018 about it called the unreasonable effectiveness of multiple dispatch. Um, I didn't try to duplicate that talk because I don't think I'll ever beat my performance that I that I gave then. Um, and it all still holds up. Um, this really is a superpower in a programming language. Um, Tomas, uh, how am I doing on time? I think I'm over. Uh, you can actually still go on a few minutes. That's just not a problem. Okay, yeah. If people want to ask questions, I'm happy to ask questions. I have a little more I could talk about. Um, mostly just, you know, mention a few th directions in the f in the future of the language that uh, people are working on, um, but yes, that would be great. You, you want to do questions or talk about some stuff? I quickly look around. Are there any questions right now? In Zoom, maybe. I don't see any raised hands right now. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you can you can just continue then. Okay, yeah. Uh, Jerry has posted in the chat the thread where we're talking about these float this floating point RAND thing. It's actually, it's a great, it's a nerd snipe. I've had a hard time not thinking about how to efficiently generate better random numbers in the unit interval. It's one of those things that you're like, how is this not a fully solved problem yet? Um, but it turns out that there's more to it than one would think. Um, all right, so a couple of the things I wanted to mention that are just, I'm not going to go into any depth here, but I'm just going to talk about some. I, I think that one of the things that people are dissatisfied with Julia about at this point is that they would like more static tooling. So it's nice that you have this dynamic feel and you can do things like start up a Jupyter notebook and throw together a little bit of like loosely typed code and just have it work. But, you know, there comes a time when your prototype turns into production and you would like help with making sure you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. Um, and that, I think, is very much the future direction of the language. I do think that people are... People may not be aware of just how much work is going on under the hood towards that. Uh, a lot of work has already happened. One of the major developments in the language and the compiler in the last um, year or so is uh, this effects system. So effects are basically, they're, they're even more power powerful than type checking because what, what type checking essentially says is that there's one specific effect that is not going to happen in this code. And that effect is that there's not going to be a type mismatch. Whereas effect systems track things like, well, you know, are there going to be any errors in this code? Are there going to be, um, 
Are there going to be uh, mutate? Is this code going to mutate anything globally? Is this code going to cons always consistently give the same answer if you give it inputs that are the same? So I can like cache the compiler knows it can cache the val values that it's computed. Um, is this code going to throw an error of any kind? Um, so <clears throat> the effect system is really powerful that way, and it has has allowed the compiler to do better so far. We've mostly used it for performance. And I think one of the things that is a really rich direction in the future is to expose the effects, the, the inference that the effect system computes about code to the author of that code and say, hey, this is what I know about your code. Um, and also to allow the authors to say, this is what I would like to be true of this code, like help me get there, right? I would like to show that this code doesn't allocate. Um, one of the major tools that's evolving to do this is JET. So JET.JL is a package that lets you analyze your code um, and sort of see some of the effects that it has and what types of things it does. Um, the major problem, JET is actually, it's wildly good already. The major problem it has is that presenting the information to the user is still a bit of a disaster. Um, it's very complicated to read. It took me a couple of days to kind of get the hang of it. And then once I did, I can understand it, but it's really, you can look at this output and you're like, what is going on here? It's really, it's complicated to read, but this is essentially, this is essentially giving you a superset of the information that a type checker would tell you about your code. Um, so JET is a very powerful tool that we're actively working on. Uh, Shuhei is the developer. It's an, an incredible tool. He's done great work on it. And uh, he works at Julia Computing. He's on our compiler team. He continues to do excellent work on this and other things. Um, Aqua is a great tool package for auto quality assurance for Julia packages. It checks a lot of just sort of things you should be paying attention to and doing in your code. Uh, no method ambiguities, no undefined exports, no unbound type parameters, no stale dependencies in your project file. Lots of things that it's just good to keep tra track of and avoid doing, you know, messy stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, <clears throat> setting up Aqua on your projects and having it automatically run on every commit is a really great idea. Um, Julia Formatter is a great tool. This isn't really in the static type checking vein, but it is, you know, if you don't want to have arguments about how to format code in a project, uh, you know, you can just run Julia Formatter. And like it says here, it's inspired by Go Format, Reformat, and Black, um, other types of formatting tools to just take the take the pain out of it, just type your code. It'll it'll check to make sure or or enforce that it is um, formatted in a consistent way. Um, the somewhat misnamed package compiler is, uh, it lets you take a, pretty much an arbitrary Julia application and bundle up all of the things that it depends on and uses and put them into a single self-contained, uh, system image with dependencies that can run as an application. Um, the problem with it, it actually works great. The problem with it is that it takes, it, it doesn't. People think of static compilation and they're like, oh, well, you know, you produced me a static app. Therefore, there are no, you know, type errors or there's no allocation or there's no garbage collector or there's no code generation. All of that is not true. That's you can generate a self-contained app that can do all of those things. And that's exactly what this does. It works just like Julia would work. It just is a self-contained application. So that's sort of on the far, like it can do everything side of the spectrum, but it also doesn't, it doesn't help you not do anything wrong. Um, it just lets you do anything Julia would do. Uh, on the far other far end is static compiler, which basically assumes that you don't do anything that uses the runtime at all. And if that is true, it will give you a like C callable, completely static function that does that thing. This works, but it also doesn't prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot. Um, if you don't follow its implicit rules, it just will crash. Um, so obviously something in the middle, some, some, there's a number of points in the spectrum between package compiler and static compiler. Um, 
that would be desirable. Um, Jeff, uh, no, it actually wasn't Jeff. It was uh, the the state of Julia uh, talk from JuliaCon this year has a has a section about this, and it's it's going to be it's much more interesting and in depth than I can do here. But basically, you know, the idea is that we really want to have some something somewhere in between um, in terms of static compilation. And uh, it was Tim Holy. That's who was talking about it. Tim Holy um, is has talked about the future of this. And this is actively being worked on. It's one of those things that's a bit of a submarine process where, you know, you can't as a user see anything until it like mostly works. Um, but the, But a lot of work has been done and it continues to be done on this. All right, that's really all I had. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them.